This panel, filmed on Thursday, January 28, 2021, was moderated by Jenny Rossman, State Attorney's Office, Circuit 9. It is titled, Human Trafficking Laws and Policies, Where Do We Go From Here? Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the panel on human trafficking laws and policies. Where do we go from here? We're going to be discussing what has been working and what does the future hold in the legal realm with human trafficking. I want to begin by thanking the amazing organizations that are hosting this conference, uh, UCF Center for Public and Nonprofit Management, United Abolitionists, and Tomas Lares, who brings so many of us together, Paving the Way Foundation and Valencia College downtown. Let me uh, next introduce our panelists. Um, we have Judge Marie Iglesias. She's a former 11th Circuit judge presiding over Miami-Dade's Human Trafficking Grace Court. Uh, we also have with us Lisa Haba. She's an attorney specializing in civil litigation on behalf of human trafficking and sexual abuse victims and a former criminal human trafficking prosecutor. We also have with us today uh, Katie O'Rourke. She's a victim service specialist with the Office of the Attorney General, Office of Statewide Prosecution. And last but not least, uh, Samuel Curette. He's the Chief Operating Officer at Zero Trafficking. Um, so we're going to, if we can, start with um, Judge Maria Iglesias. Uh, I think she's appearing virtually, so hopefully this works. Um, and technology, and Your Honor, if you can't hear us, let us know. <laughs> um, so um, I can hear first, you. Let's let me um, start by asking you to introduce yourself to us um, and tell us a bit about your experience. Yes. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, as she stated earlier, I was a former, I, I was a judge in Dade County servicing Miami children and families. I was um, assigned to the Juvenile and United um, Family Division. And in 2016, I created, along with the help of my team, Grace Court, which serviced all human trafficking victims that were involved in anything having to do with either dependency, delinquency, delinquency. Judge Iglesias, I'll just ask you then um, if you can explain um, to us what Grace Court is and um, and how that worked. Okay. Um, Grace Court was a court that was <clears throat> designed to service victims that were minors involved in human trafficking and your Honor, can you tell us what a typical day looked like for somebody in Grace Court and for Your Honor presiding over it? Of course. Um, the cases were identified either by the Department of Children and Families, by Juvenile Justice System, or by the clerk's office. And then if that case was flagged either as a victim of human trafficking or at high risk of being trafficked, it would go into my division. I did hear other cases also, but obviously for the purposes of today, we will only focus on the human trafficking. A day, there was never a typical day. All the days were very, very different, but bottom line, a child would be brought in usually either by her case manager, by her probation officer, or on their own. I usually refer to them as her, which I really shouldn't have been trying to correct myself for the last 10 years. But unfortunately, we have not done a very good job in identifying boys. Um, the cases would come in and they are treated basically like any other case in the sense that it would obviously follow the protocol of the law. It's still a courtroom. We would still have to follow the rules of evidence, the rules of juvenile procedure, of criminal procedure, and what have you. The big difference was that everybody would work together to try and find services that would be appropriate for each child. We tried to have it um, not as cookie cutter as all other cases because the needs of these children um, is very different than your typical child. I think what made it work best was that we had a human trafficking survivor mentor in court that could relate to the children. As much as I tried to relate to them, obviously I'm not in their position, 
but someone that had been in the life, had survived the life can relate to them much, much better. In addition to that, the therapist that the child was assigned to would always go to court with them. And that was a gigantic. Can you explain to us what were some of the successes of the model and what were some things that could be improved upon? Well, success was uh, measured differently than your normal, typical child. If um, a child ended up going to school, even if she was flunking out or he was flunking out of school, we saw that as a success because at least they were getting to school. It's very, very difficult to reach these children. They don't see themselves as victim. And that's the first challenge. Some of the successes were that eventually a few of them, a good amount of them got out of the life. I did have one child that obtained a scholarship, a full scholarship to University of Florida. That's obviously a gigantic success. Um, there was another child that now she's a mentor for other human trafficking victims. That too was a very big success. Unfortunately, the successes in Grace Court, as in all human trafficking cases, are minute. And um, I would measure a success a child that started coming to court positive for marijuana because then she wasn't positive any longer for Molly's cocaine, ecstasy, and all those harder drugs. So there was many successes. It's very um, frustrating because it takes a very long time. Grace Court and your experience um, with that particular system, how can that serve as a national model? Um, I think it already has served as a national model. There are other courts that are trying to mimic Grace Court. The biggest obstacle, for lack of a better word, is that people are afraid that it cannot be done. I had many um, different jurisdictions come visit Grace Court and their biggest uh, concern is how can this be done? And it really can be done so long as everybody is invested. Is there anything else that you would like to add that I haven't asked you about, about um, Grace Court and sort of the legal issues that we are confronting when fighting human trafficking? I think the biggest thing is forums like this one, that you are educating people, that you're bringing up the issue. And what we focused on greatly was training everybody. It's a mindset. It's um, people don't see these children as victims. They see them as, well, if they hadn't run away, this wouldn't have happened. Well, if they didn't want to sleep around, they wouldn't be sleeping around. And it's really a mindset that we need to change, not just for the court system, but for society in general. I think that's the biggest challenge, getting everybody on board, um, getting everybody to participate, to be aware of the signs to look for, Parents have to be educated on this also. Some parents are very, very judgmental of their children and I'm not trying to minimize it. It must be extremely difficult to have your child not come home days on end and you're worried about the, them and um, you don't know where- Question on the, um, on the panel about the difficulties that other jurisdictions found when trying to replicate on um, Grace Port. What I found was that most jurisdictions are willing to do a diversion court to try and keep kids out of delinquency. And if a child is picked up for a delinquency act, trying to divert them from going to juvenile detention. And that's not what Grace Court did. It was one of the things we did, but basically what we did was put them the therapy and the education to get them out of the life. The biggest complaint that I found from other jurisdictions is how are we going to fund this? And how is this gonna be paid for? We never had any funding. So long as you get people to want to do it, it's just their mindset. John, I really appreciate um, your willingness to, to speak with us and to appear here today. You're very welcome. Um, our next panelist that we have with us today um, is Lisa Haba. Um, I'd introduced her before. Ms. Haba um, is an attorney who specializes in um, civil litigation um, on behalf of human trafficking victims. Um, 
Ms. Haba, can you please um, sort of introduce you, but can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Thank you so much for having me on the panel today. It's an honor to be here. Um, I do want to note that we are officially six feet apart, yes. so I think we're okay taking masks off. Um, but I had started my legal career as a prosecutor in Seminole County, Florida. Um, I was an assistant state attorney in that district, and I spent about eight years as a prosecutor. During that time, I was the lead prosecutor on the first human trafficking case to come forward in Seminole County and to ever be prosecuted, with which we had great success. Additionally, I would note that in addition to human trafficking prosecutions, I also spent the majority of my time working on sex crime prosecutions. So we got a tremendous amount of experience working with victims of vulnerable ages and experiences. In addition to that, there was a point in time when I decided to leave the state, the state government and move into the private sector. And part of that was that we saw that prosecutions were absolutely happening Criminals were being held accountable for the heinous crimes they were committing against victims. But what was not being held accountable was businesses. And there was a tremendous number of businesses, entities, and individuals out there that were contributing to human trafficking, but doing nothing about it. So we have launched in the Haba Law Firm a practice where we focus on a victim-centered, trauma-informed approach, working with victims and making sure that they can seek justice not only from their perpetrators, but also from those that would profit from and exploit victims of human trafficking. Given your experience, Ms. Haba, what are the greatest challenges with um, human trafficking litigation? And we'll start first with um, your experience as a criminal prosecutor. Sure. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we, we dealt with in human trafficking is you have to take into account that anytime a person is being raped repeatedly. Anytime a person is being victimized repeatedly over and over and over again, multiple times a day, the trauma embedded in that person is so severe that it's hard to live with it. And it's not a minor thing to say that. It, it is so severe that many victims become suicidal. Many victims don't wanna be here anymore and they don't have an out. So the way they cope is the only way they know how in a situation is a lot of times either their traffickers force them to become addicted to drugs or they use drugs to numb the very hell they are living on a daily basis. And because of that severe addiction that often comes with victims of human trafficking, that is probably the hardest battle that I had to deal with when I was a criminal prosecutor. Because if you're dealing with an addiction, obviously you're fighting not only the fear and the trauma, but you're also fighting a dependency on a substance that can control whether or not your victim shows up for court. It can show, it can decide whether or not you're in the middle of trial and all of a sudden you don't have a person to put on the stand because of, a, because of that situation. So there's been many cases where we've had prosecutions end up in plea deals, not because that was desired or wanted, but because at the end of it, it was a matter of, I don't know if my victim's going to show up for court and we don't get two tries. We don't get two bites of this apple. Right. So you either um, make, make a, a best choice you can to get the most you can out yeah. of this defendant or in the alternative, you risk having them walk a free person out the yeah. door and potentially go harm the very people that we're, that we're trying to protect. Do you face those um, same or different challenges when you're talking about a civil lawsuit? So a civil lawsuit absolutely can face the same challenges. I have plenty of cases right now where that is the issue we're dealing with, but there's a different set of problems that come with civil. With civil lawsuits, the bigger problem is the fear that comes with it, because not every civil case has a, a tangential criminal case. Some of them do. We wish all of them did, but they do, not, they do not always have that criminal component. So if you don't have law enforcement involved in a, in a matter, or maybe the trafficker is in jail, but the business is still operating and other traffickers are, are profiting you know, through that business, there's a huge fear element involved with it and the shame element. You know, I had a, a defense attorney in a civil suit yesterday during a conference with him. He told me, well, I don't think fear is realistic anymore for, for victims of human trafficking because we're in the Me Too era now. So everyone knows what's going on. To say that they're being shamed publicly is ridiculous. We think all victims of human trafficking are, are probably being celebrated for their bravery and therefore there's no fear element. You can't prove that. I, I honestly was never been more stunned in my life at such a um, uninformed opinion. But regardless, that particular opinion is one that seems to be shared by the other side or being attempting to be manipulated. So we are certain that, there, that the fear element is a very, very real factor, both from a humiliation aspect 
as well as a danger aspect. So why should victims of human trafficking seek a civil lawsuit? Isn't this something that the police could just handle? Well, that's a great question. Um, we talked about it a little bit, but we have two different sides of the same coin. We have criminal laws, which go after individuals. If you have a trafficker, if you have a pimp, if you have a person who is hurting another person, that's exactly what the police do. They target those people, they go after them, they arrest them, and hopefully, fingers crossed, they convict them. But on the other hand, when you have a hotel who knows there's human trafficking happening in their rooms and they profit from it every single day. And every time they rent a room to the same person and hear the violence down the hall and see what's going on in the rooms and do nothing but, but make money off of it, that very, very thing is going to allow them to make money and profit from the exploitation of a human being. So that business cannot be criminally prosecuted. You can't prosecute a business, but you certainly can hold them civilly accountable and you can hit them where it hurts. So we go after their finances because the victim who was harmed because of the inaction of that business should be made whole and the business should be the one to pay that, to pay that repercussion. Where have you seen, I know today we're talking about the laws and things that can, can you see the most change in the laws regarding human trafficking? I would say there's two things specifically in the realm that I deal with that have been tremendously difficult hurdles to work with. One is that in some states, we have no statute of limitations on child sexual exploitation. In other states, we have it. And federally, there's a 10-year statute of limitation on the human trafficking civil action. So that pretty much means that here we are in 2021. If you were trafficked as a child back to 2011, we can file a lawsuit on your behalf. If you were trafficked as a child in 2009, for example, and it's taken you until now to overcome your trauma, or maybe you're the, the guy who did this to you or the female that did this to you, <coughs> excuse me, just got arrested and finally you feel safe enough to come forward. Sorry, you know, unless we can prove something to extend that, that period of time, which is a very difficult hurdle, there's nothing we can do for you civilly. I just think that when we're dealing with children, especially in severe trauma involving human trafficking, there should not be a statute of limitations for child sexual exploitation. The other issue that we're dealing with, um, and we deal with it quite frequently here in Florida, is that our Florida legislature has not passed a civil cause of action, meaning the civil ability to sue somebody or sue an entity or a person under our laws. We criminally can go after people in the state, but not civilly. So every civil lawsuit I file has to be found, filed in federal court. And there's obviously a, a vast difference between federal court and state court, but we are completely dependent upon the federal court system in the state of Florida to handle any issues involving civil human trafficking. And I think it would be very beneficial to our state to have that open up to be a state cause of action so that victims have the opportunity to bring it in the state of Florida as a state cause of action. Um, so speaking about laws, um, we've been hearing about um, the Federal Communications Decency Act in the news. Does that affect human trafficking and the protection of children online? Tremendously. Um, the Communications Decency Act was passed back in 1996. And basically it's exactly what the, the title of it says, Communications Decency Act. It was enacted way before social media existed, but it was intended to be a statute that when computer platforms, something, for example, Twitter or Facebook or you, know, you name it, has a third party platform in which other people can post, they didn't want, they wanted a free and open internet. The, the point was to allow a free and open internet, but not punish those companies that would have these massive platforms, <coughs> excuse me, so that they could allow that free and open internet to occur. It was never contemplated by our legislature, or excuse me, by Congress, to allow a free and open internet to promote criminal activity. And yet the way our courts have interpreted it over the years and the way it's been written, the current status of that is that if a big tech, for example, were to censor something, if they were to take something down, if they were to choose not to act, you know, as to content on their platform, there's pretty much complete immunity right now for them. So if you really think about that, you know, Katie's sitting here next to me, if I were to take child pornography or victim you know, videos of a child being trafficked and raped and harmed, and I were to hand it to Katie, I can be prosecuted for that. 
I can be sued for that. I can be held accountable for that. But if I was a big tech platform and I did the same thing and I was involved with allowing on my platform that same material to pass, there's complete immunity for that. And so that's a real, real problem in this country right now. It's a real problem with the interpretation of the law as it's written currently. And one thing our firm has actually done the last week, we filed a massive lawsuit against Twitter for allowing child pornography, not only to remain on its platform, but when they were notified it was there by, by a boy who was 13 when he was abused, they refused to take it down. Now, we don't know exactly what their response is going to be. We anticipate it will be a claim of immunity under, under 230. Obviously, we'll have to wait and see, but you can certainly tune in if you wanted to follow that. You know, there's, there's plenty of other lawsuits around the country right now. There's one against Craigslist. There's one, I believe there's one in the works against Facebook. And there's a, there's a number of other um, law firms out there that are pursuing the same thing. Wow. Uh, I know we have only a couple of minutes left, but can you, um, can you also speak to us about human trafficking um, vacating of judgments and expungement law as it is in Florida right now? Yes, Florida is unique. We're one of only a handful of states around the country that has an expungement law, but it is truly a wonderful thing. Victims of human trafficking often are forced to commit crimes that they don't choose to commit. We often see victims of human trafficking facing drug charges in criminal court, facing prostitution charges in criminal court, facing, you know, you name it, crimes that their traffickers force them to commit. And so I have a case right now, for example, where a victim of human trafficking was forced to use drugs against her will by her trafficker. And when the trafficker was arrested and his house was raided, the victim of human trafficking was arrested for possession of cocaine. And she is now facing felony charges because of what her trafficker did to her. So ultimately at the end of all this, you know, when we, when we look at our laws, Victims should not be punished for what was not their fault. They should not be criminally held accountable for something they had no control over and they didn't choose to do. So our law basically allows for a victim of human trafficking to expunge or remove from their criminal record and completely obliterate a criminal record if it can be proven to be that it was happened because of their trafficking. Awesome. Um, what, what a great opportunity for them um, as well. Next, we have on the panel, um, Katie O'Rourke. And Katie, if you can please introduce yourself to us and tell us a little bit about your experience. Absolutely, so my name is Katie O'Rourke. I have been a victim advocate for about 15 years now, um, specializing in human trafficking cases for the past 10 years, um, both in Colorado and then now here, I work with the Office of Statewide Prosecution housed at the Attorney General's Office here in Central Florida. Um, Katie, I know things have changed a bit with the pandemic, um, but if you could just walk us through what a typical, perhaps pre-pandemic um, day would be like for you and sort of what your job looks like on a practical level. Absolutely. So as a victim advocate, the I think the most important part of my role is to maintain a relationship and a good rapport um, and a trusting relationship with all of the victims in the cases that we have at statewide prosecution. So a lot of my job looks like catching up with the victims, checking in with them, um, seeing what they need and, and what services um, that I can assist putting in place. Um, and I think that kind of ties right into the second most important part of my job is making sure I have a running list um, and I'm well-versed in the services that are out there for victims, um, whether that's financial services, therapeutic services, um, what housing options are out there to include, you know, human trafficking specific programs. Um, a lot of what I do is travel throughout, you know, the state or, or even um, trying to make contacts with human trafficking programs outside of the state to find out what those programs provide for the victims, what that looks like so that I can better prepare them if they are entering a program um, and making sure that you know, if a victim is looking for a human trafficking program, that they are matching with a program that will best fit their needs. So a lot of times I am doing a lot of resource identification and looking in and outside of this uh, Central Florida community to find new and upcoming resources that would be a good fit for the population I'm working with. How has COVID sort of made your job a little more difficult? What are the, the challenges that you're having with securing services for victims in the middle of a pandemic? 
Yeah, I think it, it, it has certainly made things more difficult. Um, like I was saying with this population, you know, building and developing a rapport is incredibly important. And that involves you know, meeting with victims often. And so I think it's been a challenge, a significant challenge for most service providers to continue to have that really good connection and relationship with the victim while having to quarantine, stay at home, or um, you know, or even social distance. So I think that's been one of the main challenges that a, a lot of service providers have had and have had to kind of get creative with checking in virtually or setting up FaceTimes or even meeting and making sure that those meetings are outside, social distance, involving masks, that kind of thing. Um, so I think that's been a significant challenge. Um, I also think, you know, the resources for victims have, have certainly been a challenge in since um, COVID-19. You know, financial resources, I think a lot of nonprofits or um you know, even church organizations are experiencing some don donations and financial resources start to um, disseminate. And so I think that affects where um, myself as a victim advocate, I can find resources for victims. I think housing too has been a challenge because rightfully so, a lot of our short-term or emergency housing options require someone to be cleared by COVID before they can enter their home, which of course is understandable, but it makes it difficult to find, you know, a bed for that survivor on an emergency basis. So I think that's definitely been a challenge and, you know, something that's been a, a work in progress um, and developing as this pandemic continues to surge on. Yeah. I'm going to switch topics a little bit um, and talk to you a little bit about Marcy's Law. Um, can you um, explain for us how your office has approached Marcy's Law in making sure that victims have their rights under that law met? Absolutely. Um, so I, I think that Marcy's Law, even though it's not brand new, I think there's a lot of agencies that are still trying to work through all of the aspects of Marcy's Law to make sure that they're you know, adhering to Marcy's Law, which if you aren't aware, um, Marcy's Law that was passed here in Florida was put in place to protect the rights of the victim um, throughout the criminal justice process and make sure that they have a meaningful role in that process, whatever role that they are wishing. And I think that's one of the major aspects of the law is as it talks about each right that they have um, to be notified of court hearings, to be present at court hearings, to have a significant voice um, at major court hearings like bond hearings, um, sentencing, trial, of course. So as it puts those rights in place, it the language throughout the law talks about their ability to opt into this. And I think as a lot of victim services, organizations and agencies have begun to train and do um, a lot of conversation around this law, one of the most important aspects is making sure that the victims obviously have the knowledge of what they can or can't opt into. And I think that's really important because, you know, how are you supposed to opt into a right if you aren't aware of it? So um, I know for myself, one of the major things that we do when we are working an investigation um, or even as a case is getting ready to be filed is making sure that the victim is well aware of their rights according to Marcy's law, that they know, you know what they can opt in and out of and explaining to them exactly what that will look like. And I think that's important because you know, there are, one, a victim can decide at the beginning of a case that they want to opt into every option they have, every right, right that they have to be notified for every court hearing. But it can turn out that that can be disruptive to their daily lives or triggering because it will constantly be talking about the trauma that they went through when they were being victimized. So talking to them about what that looks like, allowing them to change their mind if they want to, um, allowing them to opt in to certain notifications and opt out of others. I think that's really important to make sure that they're completely explained the process, that they understand what it is, and that if at any point they want to change their mind or they have questions, they know to contact me. I you know, have it noted um, in our files what the victim's preferences are, and then I continue to check in with them throughout the process so that 
if they don't remember this conversation at the beginning of the process, or if they've changed their mind, that they're aware that they have a right to do that. What actually has been working for you as you're working to best fulfill a victim's needs? Yeah, I think especially given given our current climate, um, a lot of virtual meetings, virtual connections, um, the county um, human trafficking task force meetings, those that have now switched to virtual, I think are paramount to gauging the temperature of all the service providers in the area, um, what their financial resources look like, what are they able to do right now? Are they still able to go meet a victim where they're at? Um, or have they switched to completely virtual? And what does that look like? You know, if they're providing therapy, for example, to a victim and they have now switched to a completely virtual platform, I know that based on these meetings and um, task force meetings, these MDT um, virtual meetings, and because I know that, I can try to determine how to best set the victim up for success. Do they need do they need an iPhone or some sort of smartphone to be able to um, get their therapy virtually? Do I still need to be meeting with them because their you know phone situation is in flux? Um, and so if I'm still needing to be meeting with them in person, am I setting them up with the right services that can also still go out there and meet them in person? And a lot of victims, you know, because they've experienced this isolation due to their victimization, they still need that. So can I find the right resources to help them with that when they really need that in-person contact still? So I think... Um, a lot of the collaboration among many different service providers is still there, um, even though the meetings have changed from in-person to virtual. And I think that um, there's almost more check-ins now with victims and service providers because it isn't as easy to just meet with them whenever. It is, you know, it's kind of a production and it has to be set up ahead of time. So I, I really think that that collaboration community-wide has helped serve the victims throughout this whole time period. Awesome. Where do you think that victim advocacy is headed in the future? Um, I think specific to human trafficking, I think there's a lot of conversation right now around modeling healthy relationships and healthy bonds. Um, I think with this population specifically, a lot of them have experienced um, childhood trauma or victimization at a young age or a developmental age that has truly affected their ability to form healthy bonds and to trust, you know, to, to trust anybody that could be a supportive person in their life. And so I think there's a lot of conversation around training advocates and service providers that are on the front lines working with these victims on how to not step right into the role where you're doing everything for the victim, but to form a healthy bond and to model that behavior for them that allows you know, them to recover long-term to the best of their ability. You know, I think as an advocate, the short term, especially when you see someone in the middle of crisis that has been through significant trauma, you wanna help in every way that you can um, with everything that you can. So I think taking a step back, helping with what you know you can do and you have to do, but also helping that victim for setting them up for success long term looks like having those healthy boundaries in place and allowing them to, you know, learn how to do for themselves, ask for what they need, ask for what's most important for them um, and walk them, you know, alongside, walk alongside of them throughout this whole process. So I think um, there's a lot of training that will probably be coming, you know, in the future to certify victims and how to work through crisis intervention with this um, with this population and specifically to model those healthy relationships and healthy bonds. Thank you, Katie. Um, finally, we have uh, with us as our, our last panelist is Samuel Curet. Um, and Samuel, if you can introduce yourself to us and explain your background and experience. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, uh, depending on where you're dialing in. Uh, my name is Samuel Curet. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Zero Trafficking, a 
I come from a background of military intelligence and the law. And uh, Zero Trafficking is an organization that uh, discovers and illuminates human trafficking networks. And so it's my honor to be on this panel today to talk about how uh, laws and policies and practices around human trafficking and whether or not we treat it as organized crime, how that can have a direct impact on victims and survivors. Um, in, your ex um, in your experience, have you seen um, whether human trafficking is often treated as an organized crime or whether it's not? Uh, we've often seen in, uh, in speaking with many law enforcement uh, partners and prosecutors that a, when a victim-centered and trauma-informed approach sometimes morphs into a uh, victim-reliant approach where uh, that victim and survivor is carrying the burden of the investigation, the the, the mental fear from testifying in court, either in a, in a criminal criminal or civil case, and that often they may have a limited picture of the scope and size of the criminal network that exploited them. Uh, we've, we've also seen that the larger the criminal organization, the more they take advantage of uh, law enforcement priorities and, and prosecution practices in order to lower their signature and not become that, that law enforcement and prosecution priority. Um, so, so oftentimes we've seen that human trafficking is not treated as organized crime because it's identified at a, at a lower, more micro level. When you're talking about a victim-reliant approach, can you explain to us a little bit more about what that looks like and why you think that that is not the best approach? Certainly. Uh, so we live a digital life uh, now, and uh, I, I really, I jotted down um, what Lisa Hava said about how the fact that a free and open internet should not uh, exist to be free and open in order to promote criminal activity, but that is exactly what is happening now. And so everything that happens uh, with, with regard to the commercial sex trade and sex trafficking leaves a, a digital trace. And so when the prosecution uh, approach or the law enforcement investigation approach is centered around the story that the victim can testify to, uh, sometimes it neglects the, the digital information that is out there about the criminal organization itself. And so uh, that victim is, the, well, the, the prosecutor is left uh, in, in one sense, hoping that the victim will be able to recover from their trauma enough to be able to uh, uh, testify persuasively to, to what happened to them in a way that leads to a successful conviction or, or even shows up um, at, at trial. Uh, we had, we were helping a client in a civil case where uh, the, the victim's story was, the testimony was extremely compelling and there was all the elements of the case that were necessary. And so uh, in that particular case, they didn't put a heavy emphasis, emphasis on the digital trail that supported her story. Well, uh, it's, it's a very sad uh, story and it's, it's it, unfortunately not an isolated occurrence, but uh, that victim uh, passed away over the holidays uh, from, from a drug overdose, um, either intentional or, or accidental. And now that case is, is on the rocks because the victim that was bearing that burden succumbed to that burden before receiving justice. So can you explain to us um, sort of what your solution is? You've talked um, essentially about a victimless case. Um, what would that actually look like? Well, uh, there's, there's a tremendous amount of research uh, about how human trafficking is a nexus crime and connects to all these other criminal activities. Uh, this is this has been done both on the uh, domestic criminal criminal side of, of the research and then also from the national security sector, 
Joint Special Operations uh, University at Fort Bragg. They've written about how human trafficking is this nexus crime and connects to these broader national security threats, both here in the United States and around the world. Um, but in addition to that nexus existing, human trafficking and particularly sex trafficking is very, very unique in that it's the only large scale criminal enterprise that has a business requirement to continually advertise online in the clear web where everyone can see. And they have to do this because the business model has individual transactions that are low uh, in monetary value and with strangers. And so when you have that as your business model, you have to have a lot of customers coming in all the time in order to stay profitable. So what does this create for uh, as an opportunity for us? Well, it creates a vulnerability for sex traffickers, for the traffickers that are profiting off of this abuse. They have to be uh, a little bit careless and a little bit uh, have, have a low level of operational security in order to reach new customers. So we can exploit that through uh, instead of instead of running investigations through, I'm going to try to identify a cooperative victim. The approach should be I am going to try to identify a criminal organization through the risky business practices that they have to take to stay in business. So uh, the solution that, that we're proposing is treating human trafficking like organized crime using the tools that we have to fight organized crime against human trafficking, and then running those investigations like you would an organized crime case, identifying uh, the traffickers, their assets, their, uh, their, their financial uh, accounts, their shell companies that they use, all of these different things that they'll, they'll need to use to stay in business, the contact information that they're constantly putting out on the web in order to reach new customers, and every digital trail that they leave that makes them vulnerable is something that we can use to support the victim's story so that when the victim does come to the stand uh, or may not even need to come to the stand, they would, they would be able to exercise their rights to be notified and know that this criminal organization that victimized them and traumatized them is being taken down and uh, the weight of that criminal organization being taken down is not a burden that they have to bear on an individual level. So we're, we're talking about bringing some of the, some of the tactics that we've used uh, to fight large scale organized crime in, in the drug conflict uh, and, and also threat network mapping that we've used in counterterrorism uh, and, and in military intelligence overseas. These are methods that have been tested and, and used successfully at, at the tactical and operational level that can be brought to bear in the fight on human trafficking. Once we start treating human trafficking like the organized crime problem that it is. Why is, is human trafficking often not treated as the organized crime problem that it is? Well, I think that um, there is a tremendous amount of good work that has been done to focus on uh, getting victims connected to the services that they need and the, and the rights that they need to restore them uh, to a place where they can recover from their trauma. I think that that is absolutely right. But unfortunately, sometimes that approach also starts driving the investigation itself in a way that investigators, both at the federal and the local level, view that victim as their primary source of information for investigating and the way that uh, the investigation is gonna move forward. Uh, there's, there's also been a tremendous uh, advance in the realm of publicly available information and open source intelligence in the last decade. Uh, this has been happening in the military. Uh, there's, there's been leaders in the Defense Intelligence Agency and in the services and in the national security community that say, look, why are we spending all of this money on, on all of these um, uh, government ways and means to collect information when it's available 
at a much lower cost on the free and open internet. And so all of those advances haven't always come quickly to the law enforcement community. It's uh, the law enforcement community is often downstream of advances in intelligence and in, uh, intelligence technology in the Defense Department and the national security space. But that's changing, uh, that's changing. So we see a lot of positive movement in that space where publicly available information can be brought in by private parties or third parties to assist with these cases. Um, and the particular advantage in this case is that sex traffickers are required to make themselves vulnerable in the public domain digitally. And that's something we can exploit to help victims. With the, the current approach that we have, sort of not um, treating these as organized crimes and, and focusing so much on the victim, um, you said before that traffickers are taking advantage of that. How are they taking advantage of our current approach? Uh, well, they, they have, uh, that's their primary risk right now, is that a cooperative victim will work with law enforcement and inform law enforcement with everything they know, uh, allowing law enforcement to uh, take down the criminal organization. So that's what traffickers see as their biggest risk in the current system. And so they put a tremendous amount of resources into avoiding that risk. Uh, they do that a lot of different ways. We've already talked about uh, drug abuse, about uh, trying to get uh, victims of human trafficking to commit other crimes so that they would fear interaction with law enforcement and avoid it and avoid that cooperation. We've also seen traffickers do uh, pay very, very close attention to which jurisdictions are most actively uh, addressing human trafficking. And so their criminal organizations will span jurisdictions. And so if things get too heated in a jurisdiction, they can just kind of shift uh, almost like uh, squeezing a water balloon. The water is just going to go to another part of the balloon. Um, we're looking at a human trafficking network that was uh, started out of California. And uh, during COVID-19 uh, and, and this, this pandemic, a lot of businesses, uh, and this was, this was a criminal network that ran its operation through illicit massage brothels, their illicit massage brothels were not able to stay open in California. Well, they had a connection to Arizona and businesses were able to stay open in Arizona. And they also had a connection to Florida in Orlando and businesses were able to stay open in Orlando. So what they did is they shifted their focus there. They shifted uh, the girls that they were victimizing and traumatizing to those places as well. And uh, if an individual, um, that was controlled by their network was getting too much attention, even on consumer sex uh, forums online, they would move that person. Uh, so in one particular case, uh, a girl under the moniker of, of Jenny who had recently come from China, uh, Jenny was getting a tremendous amount of attention in uh, the Metro Phoenix area and, uh, and she left to come to Florida and uh, but we, we saw through monitoring of those uh, of those sex forums that uh, she was still going under that same uh, that same name as as Jenny, and it it kind of lined up with the trip time that we expected her to take. Uh, so I'm not sure if that <laughs> was responsive to the to the question, but we've that those are some of the some of the means by which uh, traffickers exploit the current approach. Uh, another way that they'll do it is by ensuring that their network doesn't look like a network and it doesn't become a high law enforcement priority. So we've seen that the larger the network is, the more likely that even though they may control children, they're primarily going to market adults uh, in commercial sexual advertisements, and they'll even market children as adults in order to lower kind of their, their law enforcement threshold. Uh, and, and, and finally, a, a tactic is they'll market uh, the women they control as independent prostitutes when in fact they are not. They're victims of large scale human trafficking. And um, another, another way to do that is to portray them as independent prostitutes that are addicted to narcotics. 
And in, in that scenario, uh, a, a quote unquote independent prostitute that's addicted to narcotics is likely to be at the bottom of the law enforcement priority stack for a narcotics team and also for a human trafficking team because uh, those, those law enforcement professionals will rightly assess that the likelihood that she will cooperate is very, very low. So how do we flip the script? Well, the, uh, these networks are vulnerable. They're vulnerable because uh, the more sophisticated they are and the, and the larger areas that they cover, the larger their digital footprint. And that digital footprint is something that they have to maintain in order to reach customers. The larger the criminal organization, the more customers that they need in order to remain profitable. Uh, the more customers they need, the more advertisements they have to post. The more advertisements they post, the more contact information is available online. And so ultimately, the, the message I want to bring today is that human trafficking networks are vulnerable. We can target them and we can take them out. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of our panelists. I think we do have some time for questions. Um, they were asked online. Um, okay, so the first question was to, I believe this was for Lisa Baba. Um, it's from Debbie. It's, has the law changed for police to help parents find missing or runaway minors? I'm sorry, what was the question? It was, has the law changed for police to help parents find missing runaway minors? To my knowledge, the law has not changed. I think police in their individual capacity have prioritized this and attributed runaway behavior to be the vulnerability with human trafficking that it, it currently is. So I don't think it's the laws themselves that have changed, at least to my knowledge. Um, I think it's more the enforcement mechanism being used by police I do know in Seminole County specifically, um, just by way of my own background, that the reason our human trafficking uh, component to the police department came into existence was our law enforcement drew a parallel between missing runaway juveniles and human trafficking victims that were children. And they, it, the statistics now show very clear, clearly that one out of every three minors is going to be recruited into human trafficking. So if you really think about that, if you look around, look at your own household, if you look at the people in your life, if you have three people in your family, that means one of them, if you were three, if you were three runaway children, would have been recruited into human trafficking. So there's a high propensity of recruitment. Target, uh, targets are being um, very, very easily picked out by traffickers. And now that police are more in tune to that, I think it's really opened the door to allow police to be able to enforce human trafficking and the victimology that goes with it. Thank you. The second question is for uh, Ms. Katie uh, from Lisa. She asked if you provide your information by counties. By county? So I am an advocate for statewide prosecution. So I can I can work a case in any county in the state of Florida. Um, and I can absolutely provide my information. So if there's anybody in any county that needs assistance, I would absolutely be happy to help. Thank you. Uh, this one is directed to all the panelists. Um, Josh asks, are the victims debriefed to gather information on which children may have been trafficked with them? And is that information compared to a list of missing children? Do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think any, my experience with law enforcement is any time that they're doing an interview um, for a, a victim of human trafficking, they're going to ask, were there any other individuals that you saw during your victimization that were also being trafficked? Um, and they are going to specifically ask if, if they saw anyone that looked to be under the age of 18 um, and if they knew their identifying information. I think that's every law enforcement officer that I've worked with, that is absolutely something that they will ask any victim that they're interviewing. Um, I was told I wasn't allowed enough, so. Oh, okay. um, 
So this next one is, uh, I believe it's for everyone from Lisa. Uh, do you monitor the forums on bed page? Um, I have been told that it is a replacement for back page, and another speaker said that this is not true. Uh, the sad thing is that bed page is active with sex for sale. Maybe that was directed, but they didn't specify. I, I think can take that. answer that. Um, so I, I really like the comments that uh, pointed out that bed page was an active forum, and then someone said that it is not. Uh, because the fact is, is that as we've been successful in shutting down online sex markets like Backpage in 2018 and City X Guide, which was recently seized uh, this summer, is there's a tremendous amount of platform migration that takes place. And this is regionally specific. So in one part of the country, Backpage may be extremely active. And in, in another part of the country, there might only be three posts in the last six months. And so uh, traffickers are going to test which platforms bring them the most customers in the geography where they reside and want to market. And that is always going to be a moving target. Um, I, I commend the efforts, the successful efforts to deny areas of the Internet to these organizations. But unfortunately, we've seen sites hosted out of Europe and hosted out of China uh, now gaining prominence in, in this area for uh, marketing in the United States. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for all the panelists. Um, he asked, what is the biggest challenge preventing you or your organization to do what you do to combat human trafficking effectively? You want to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, the, the largest challenge, I think, is uh, trying to shift the approach uh, towards recognizing that larger human trafficking organizations exist and then bringing uh, different government equities to that fight because human trafficking is, is an excess crime often relating to drug activity. We would like to see, uh, from our perspective, folks working in organized crime or working against drug cartels that aren't necessarily uh, tasked with human trafficking, we would like them aware of that human trafficking information and passing that information along to the ones that actually do work those cases. So uh, better communication within and among the stakeholders in order to treat human trafficking like organized crime. I think for me, the biggest challenge is when you're trying to work with the victims, you have to address the other issues going on as well. And obviously victim advocates like Katie come in very, very much in a situation like that. But, you know, for example, you know, I have plenty of clients that are true human trafficking survivors that are also facing criminal defense issues right now that are directly related to their trafficking. And that is not uncommon. That's actually kind of the norm. When it, whenever, a, you know, oftentimes I'll have a client come to me, maybe not as a human trafficking victim, but as a criminal defense client. And they'll say, I've got, I'm facing these charges for these things and a deeper delve into it really explores that they were a victim of human trafficking. Well, the challenge comes in when you're trying to work with prosecutors and work with law enforcement who maybe are not as trained or informed as they should be and trying to explain to them that they shouldn't be prosecuting a person who had, did not have the mens rea or the mental uh, choice, choice making, they didn't choose to commit this crime you know, once a crime is charged against somebody, it's very difficult to get that dropped. So that has been a very big hurdle because, of course, you're, you're trying to work with professionals and, and you're hoping that everyone has the same level of training. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So hope, hope, hopefully moving forward, there will be a greater emphasis on training amongst all law enforcement and amongst all prosecutors in the state of Florida. Um, gosh, I'm trying to, in my head, narrow it down to one challenge. Um, <laughs> I think there's a, there's a lot of challenges in the fight against human trafficking. And I think what, as I was thinking about this, what it all comes down to, I think, is where in the recovery process the victim is at. Um, I think you can face significant challenges very early on with um, loyalties to a trafficker or fear of law enforcement. Um, fear of telling their story. And then even as a victim is kind of walking through that recovery process, 
um, really wanting a victim to engage in therapeutic resources or trying to set a victim up with financial resources, a lot of times there's, there's pushback, there's significant trauma there. So there's a lot going on with their mental health that can be difficult to navigate as a victim advocate um, to make sure that, like, like I was talking about earlier, you're doing the best that you can for the victim um, and then you're also balancing that with, you know, you want to see a successful prosecution because that trafficker, it, that victim that you're working with is not the only person they've ever done this to or is ever going to do this to in the future. So you want, you know, you want it to straddle both of those really important needs to make sure that the traffickers are held accountable, that they're taken off the streets and that the victim's recovery is of utmost importance. So I think walking alongside victims and where they're at in their recovery can sometimes provide the biggest challenges to also making sure the prosecution is successful. Thank you. And I just want to uh, repeat Judge uh, Mari uh, Sempe Iglesias answer on Zoom. She can't unmute herself. Uh, there's just added challenges. Um, but she said the biggest challenge for her in South Florida is lack of homes for the children uh, and appropriate substance abuse facilities. Um, and then the this one's a longer question. Uh, this is from Catherine. And this is for all the panelists. Um, how has the criminal justice system evolved to recognize the victimization of those who have been victimized long enough to engage in trafficking behaviors themselves, i.e. peer recruiters or other trafficker right-hand people? So that's part one, if you want to take that. I guess I can, I can start. Um, there's actually a case that we're work, I'm working on right now that's a great example of this. And that is the case of uh, we're part of a class action lawsuit representing upset of almost 90 people against a fashion billionaire named Peter Nygaard. Peter Nygaard was an individual who has been raping and human trafficking women and children for 50 plus years. He, um, if you're not familiar with it from the news, he basically used his fashion empire as a front and used it both to launder money as well as to commit a criminal conspiracy and victimized women and children across the Bahamas, the United States, and Canada primarily. Now, out of everything in this case, one thing that's been very, very interesting to us is there's plenty of victims in our class action lawsuit that are truly just victims. They, they were hurt by Peter Nygaard in an isolated incident after being lured and recruited into his, into his web of lies. There's also another group of people, though, that kind of fall in, in this tricky category. And I think we saw the same thing in the Epstein case where they were victimized at the beginning. They were harmed. And then at some point through manipulation and coercion, they begin recruiting other women. And there's a lot of psychology behind it. There's a lot of, of you know, I think the, the generic reaction by most people is how could they do that? But it's not as simple as, as a black and white answer. It gets very complicated because these are master manipulators, traffickers, are so skilled at manipulation and they're so skilled at making a victim never see it coming. So for example, you know, one of our clients is an individual who's from the Bahamas. She was, she was poverty stricken. She had little to no money. She was feeding a large family and she was the only one employed in that household. There's not a social safety net in her culture. And so what she was dealing with was a choice between get the job you can get and do the job required of you to, to basically feed your children or you can quit and your children can starve to death because P Peter Nygaard at the same time as, as after he victimized her and forced her to do the things that he wanted, he also made it so that she couldn't get another job on the island. So she was living in this impossible choice where she had to choose between the starvation of her own children or she had to recruit other women for Peter Nygaard. And she had to make an impossible a choice for in an impossible situation. And so on its surface, everyone looks at her and says, I can't believe you recruited for him. But when you really look under the surface and you look at what was happening behind the scenes, this woman never had a choice. She was just trying to survive and make sure her children didn't die of starvation. So that's one example, but there's plenty, plenty more where traffickers take the vulnerability that they can find and they exploit it through every single scenario they can so that victims never see it coming. And so we hear a lot in trafficking organizations where you have a victim at one end who might start as just a victim and might elevate through the ranks. 
But keep in mind, a trafficking victim is not living like you or I, where they're looking to the future and they're having a conversation about their goals and ambitions and how today's choices might have tomorrow's consequences. They're just trying to survive in the minute they're in. Because most trafficking victims that I've, uh, I've ever worked with, they literally think they could die in five minutes from now, from their trafficker, from drugs, from one of the, the men that comes and buys commercial sex from them. Every minute could be their last. And so they literally live in the minute and just try to survive. No, I mean, I echo exactly what you said. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, the second part of that question. All right, the second part is, how can the criminal justice system incentivize victims to come forward even if they've engaged in recruitment themselves? You want to take it? Yeah. Um, I think... You know, I think it is difficult and a lot of them do believe that they will be penalized. Um, but I think having open and transparent conversations with them um, about, again, what the criminal justice system would look like, the case going through the criminal justice system, um, what, especially learning their stories and what their participation was, like Lisa was saying, if that was due to coercion and fraud and physical fear of violence, or even uh, a lot of times the threats that traffickers make to, um, if you don't recruit, you know, I, not only will I hurt you, but I will hurt your family. I will hurt your children. I won't allow you to get your children back. Those kinds of things. Um, so I think having that open conversation with uh, the victims that ha have been through this about what a prosecutor is looking for, what a prosecutor um, understands about human trafficking, and understanding too that it may take a couple of conversations. Rightfully so, like we were all talking about earlier, there's trust issues when it comes to victims that have, have been through this kind of trauma. So understanding that it may take a couple of conversations to really work through everything that the victim was put through um, and to include what they were also forced or coerced into doing. I just wanna add one thing to that. The other thing they can do is they can hire a lawyer. I mean, I know one of the things I do for a lot of victims is I will represent a victim who has the potential to be in that category of somebody who might have some criminal exposure or some criminal issues. And I'll work with them because obviously if they go to the prosecution and say certain things, prosecutor may be forced to act and not because they want to prosecute a victim by any means. I'm not inferring that under any circumstance, but there are certain things that can, that sometimes when you're admitting to criminal activity, either a prosecutor might be uninformed or untrained, or they're very well trained, but their, their hands are bound by the law. So one way to get around that is if they hire a lawyer who is understands human trafficking to represent their victim interests, then that, that lawyer can work with the prosecutor without compromising the victim's safety, integrity, or, or freedom and get to a solution that can work for the, in their best interest. I absolutely agree with both of those responses. Uh, the only thing I would add, which is very brief, I think an excellent way to help victims come forward and not be afraid is to arrest the trafficker first and seize all of their assets first before asking the victim to cooperate. Thank you. Um, that is all the questions from the chat. So we have about 15, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have anything that they wanted to add or anything that came up with the questions? Do you want to provide our contact information? That would be lovely. Okay. Um, I guess I'll state it, and if you don't mind, can we type it in the thing so we can write it down? Um, if, if anybody wants to reach out to me with any questions or concerns in the future, I'm, I'm obviously available. My firm is the Haba Law Firm. It's www.habalaw.com. My phone number is 844-422-2522. And if you call that number, um, obviously we'll have somebody help you and get back to you right away. You can reach out to Zero Trafficking via our website and that's www.zerotrafficking.com. And uh, contact number is area code 703-646-8000.
8135. Okay, and my name again is Katie O'Rourke um, with Statewide Prosecution. So my email address is Katie, K A T I E, dot O'Rourke, which is O R O U R K E, at my Florida Legal, all spelled out, dot com. Um, and since we are all currently working from home, um, my cell phone number, should anyone need to reach out, is 407 205 5331. Awesome. Okay, if you don't have any more questions online, I think we're good. Um, oh, someone asked, sorry. Oh, that's um, all right. Terry asked if you are. I'm assuming everybody, if you're familiar with NLETS, the International Justice and Public Safety Network, they connect all LE through the country and internationally via Interpol. Is there anything they could do to assist with information sharing and human trafficking cases? I, I am not familiar with them. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar either. Um, I, I don't know that I'm familiar with them, but obviously if they have information to provide, if, if you'd like to connect, I think Katie would probably be the best source. And yeah, absolutely. And then, and if it's law enforcement specific information, we could always get you to the um, most appropriate law enforcement officer. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.